I always talk about the people who are most valuable to me in the organization are the dot connectors. You can see things in different places and say, hey, if that works over here, we can leverage it over there. In the traditional IT, we used to be order takers. We used to just do whatever we were asked to do, keep the lights on, take orders. I think we can add a lot more value if we can be partners and if we can understand the business so we can then make sure we're working on the things that are going to need the most for the business. I don't know if any of us could have imagined a few years ago what we're starting to see happen so quickly. It does definitely provide us an opportunity. And our business customers are getting very savvy, so they're seeing it because we're faced with it every day. So if we're not on top of that, our business customers are going to become more savvy than we are. So I think we're going to stay one step ahead, and I think it does open up a lot of opportunity for us. Welcome to the new automation mindset where AI automation and integration come together. I'm your host, Marcus Zern, and as Chief Strategy Officer and part of the founding executive team at Mercado, it is my mission to find these top innovators in AI automation and integration and share their journeys with all of you. This podcast is inspired by the Wall Street Journal bestselling book with the same title, written by Workado CEO Vijay Tella. If you would like a free copy of the book, be sure to listen for a special offer at the end of today's episode. So for today's episode, I have uh, with me Judith Apshago. Uh, she's the Chief Digital Officer at Amtrak, and she's also an Orbi winning uh, a CIO with actually very diverse experience. So in addition to rail, you know, Judith also worked in industrial materials and also uh, uh, quite a few uh, IT leadership positions in, in pharma, in, in, in biotech. So it's actually really exciting to have you on here, Judith. And what I, you know, what I wanted to do, just given we we got to know each other just a little bit, um, I was impressed by what you were able to do in your career, really as an IT leader, to have have an impact on on the business, on, on business processes, and so on. And uh, as this is kind of the the, the podcast that goes together with our new automation mindset uh, book, which is about the modern IT leader and uh, it really being about process, growth, and scale. I thought it would be just uh, a fascinating just just learn from you uh, and hear you know what you've done in your career and uh, and and basically dig into almost like think of this as a process innovation special episode here. Um, so first of all, uh, welcome, uh, welcome again, and and maybe let's start with um, with Amtrak. I mean, Amtrak is obviously it's a big job, right? It's a uh, it's a big uh, um, uh, enterprise. Um, I've worked a little bit with the German railway, and so one of the things I learned is like you know how important predictive maintenance is, like for for on time uh, uh, reliability of the trains and so on. Tell us a little bit what you're working on right now at Amtrak. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Uh, looking forward to our discussion. And uh, it's an exciting time to be in rail. As you mentioned, you've had a little bit of exposure. And with um, the growth in investments through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we kind of had this once in a generation opportunity to invest in places, including technology, to really evolve um, the future of rail. So it's an exciting place to be. And uh, my role at Amtrak as Chief Digital Officer is to help evolve um, our use of technology and um, really leverage technology, data, and systems to drive business transformation. So it's an exciting uh, time. And you mentioned predictive maintenance. It's one of the most exciting projects I think that we have going on right now in the technology space is helping our um, operations team, our mechanical folks become more prescriptive and um, more intentional about how we maintain our assets. And so our goal is to move to a more a condition-based and predictive model where we're maintaining assets based on what the systems are telling us in terms of the, the equipment. Not so much if you think about uh, maintaining your car, and these days cars are getting smarter too, but uh, you know, it used to be every you know, 3,000 miles or 6,000 miles, depending on the maintenance schedule, you just go get your oil changed, whether it's dirty or not, right? Uh, and so that's, that's how historically we've done our maintenance as well. But now the idea is to move to a model where we have a lot of sensors on the trains themselves, as well as along the tracks on what we call the wayside that are collecting all kinds of data. And we're in the midst of refreshing a lot of our fleets 
So we have the new Acellas coming out later this year. We've already been refreshing some of our, um, our locomotives. We have our inner city train sets. The Aero Fleet is going to be replaced over the next few years and then we'll move into long distance. So there's a, lo a lot of uh, new fleets. And as we're building these new fleets, we're building more sensors, more um, smart technology as part of the, these trains. And likewise, we're doing the same along the tracks. So we're implementing uh, data collection devices along the wayside. And some of these have been in place for a while and we've been collecting this data, but it's now with the power of um, a lot more tools at our disposal, we can actually ingest the data and start to uh, make it a little smarter for us and, and you know, really use that to look for patterns and look for anomalies. So our vision is, um, and we're in the we're in the early stages. We have a lot of the data that we've been collecting. Um, we're looking at those patterns and we'll be leveraging AI to uh, help us be, be able to look for those patterns and those anomalies and look at you know what's normal, what's not normal. Um, so AI is going to give us an advantage we haven't um, had in the past. But um, you know, for us, it's going to be a game changer because it's really looking at uh, how we can better leverage our resources, how we can reduce downtime for our trains, which keeps our trains on time, uh, keeps our customers happy, you know, makes makes for a smoother ride, um, and you know, just overall, I think it's it's going to be a true game changer. Um, at the same time, we're looking at implementing an enterprise asset management system. We have systems today, legacy technologies, but we're refreshing those, replacing with um, a more modern platform that can uh, integrate with you know, all this great data we're collecting so that if we do start to see anomalies or something that doesn't look right, we can flag that, create a work order automatically, and then send that off to our mechanical team so they can you know, check things out. Ideally, before, you know, if, if we see something in transit, we have a lot of cross-country routes. You know, maybe you can catch something at the next stop and, and take care of it so it doesn't become an issue down the road. So there's there's a lot we can do once we have the building blocks in place. So right now we're laying the foundation for that. Uh, and over the next, uh, you know, months and years, we'll be continuing to build on that and really make it a, a game changer for us. It sounds like a really interesting solution, right? So, and, I, and, and, and probably solution is the right term because you, as you mentioned, you know, you have an application, a new business system, asset management uh, uh, in there. You have, it seems like IoT sensors, right? That you're placing, so mm -hmm. hardware in there. You got uh, data processing and, and AI in there. So, in, in, and then you're, mm -hmm. in, with your organization, you're putting all of this together to really make that, that impact for the business. Do I see that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so it's a, a multi-pronged um, kind of ecosystem of technologies and uh, using the, the data that we're collecting. Some of it is measurement data, some of it is images. There's uh, thermal and vision cameras and, and scanners along the wayside. And with the evolution of technology, it's gotten, uh, it's really interesting because we have high-speed trains that travel along the Northeast Corridor. So the technology has to be able to capture this data at speed. Uh, we've partnered with some, some real good vendors that are uh, helping us, you know, tackle that challenge, and we found some good technology to allow us to do that. So we also partner with the freight railroads because <clears throat> we own the, the tracks along the Northeast Corridor. That's Amtrak territory. But when we get off of the corridor and go cross country, um, we're now traveling on the freight partners' uh, territory, and they are capturing a lot of this data for themselves. So we've now established partnerships where. Um, we're getting some of this data directly from the freights and we're able to ingest it into our system so we can leverage it. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really some of the foundational work is, is our investment. Some of it's been put in, put in place by some of our partners. But uh, yeah, multi-pronged uh, solution. And I think it'll just continue to evolve as new technology comes and, and provides a little more flexibility and help ingest and, um, and use this data. I like the I like the data sharing uh, uh, aspect of that as well. You know, I've 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 been impressed. You know, I've I've used the Excel recently. Uh, you know, very impressed by the new station there in uh, in Manhattan. Uh, that that's that's quite something. I think uh, yep. most airports could be could be uh, jealous of, <laughs> of that of that new station. And then you know all the the online ordering and the Wi-Fi on board. I think you guys do an uh, amazing job. So so congratulations. Well, let me let me ask you. So this is this is a great example. I did wanna I did wanna also talk about little, you know, maybe a little bit of your 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 past, right? Uh, you know, when we spoke briefly, you mentioned the example at uh, U.S. Silica, 
So here we're talking, it's a different industry, right? So this is industrial material. I mean, it's kind of like very pure sand, effectively, that uh, that's being used, uh, you know, in, in oil industry or any construction filtering uh, and, and so on. Mm-hmm. What, what did you do there? Uh, um, because I think you had a great story there also how you did process innovation at, at U.S. Silica. Yeah, yeah, so U.S. Silica, <clears throat> excuse me, I um, was my, my role prior to Amtrak. I was there for five and a half years, and it was a great company. Uh, it still is a great company uh, in the mining and minerals industry. And uh, U.S. Silica is a sand mining company with about 30 mines around the country. And uh, when I joined, the company had just gone public. So historically, it was a 100-year-old company, had actually uh, been in the sand business for a long time, but was really targeting the industrial sector. And when the company went public in 2012, their intent was to grow in the oil and gas space. And to do that, the company really needed to scale. So my first job was to take kind of a small, largely outsourced IT organization and grow it into a scalable organization. Um, And then over the next five plus years, the company was in growth mode. So we acquired uh, six six other companies. And one of those was a company called Sandbox. And Sandbots had kind of a unique story at the time. I think since then they're they're not the only game in town. But uh, but Sandbox produced these metal boxes made out of steel, and they held about 25 tons, which is about the equivalent of what a truck of sand would hold. And historically, the trucks that are delivering sand to the, the well site for oil and gas drilling, it's mixed with water and some other things and creates a slurry that's pumped down into the well and basically holds open the bedrock to improve the the production and the flow. So it was a big kind of innovation in the oil and gas industry. And uh, that the trucks that are delivering the sand, there used to be long lines just waiting to unload. So Sandbox came with, up with an idea, you know, rather than waiting until they need the sand at the well site, why don't we put it in a box, we can stack it at the well site, and then they can get it as they need to, just forklift it over the well. Um, so that the company grew up as just a small mom and pop company. Uh, U.S. Silica acquired Sandbox and saw that there was great potential, but their processes were all done on paper and in spreadsheets, and you know everything was manual. So our job was to figure out how to scale the the business, how to get those systems to a place where they could grow. Um, and it was a huge partnership with the business. We um, spent a lot of hours, you know, whiteboarding and process mapping and figuring out, trying to think differently about how we could put systems in place to support these processes. So the end-to-end solution is one of my favorite stories because I just think it's a huge, it was a huge success. And they're still evolving. I had lunch with a former colleague last week and he told me, you know, where they've taken the system now. And I think, you know, again, as technology evolves, we continue to, to make things better. Uh, but even then, it was a great solution, which started with um, a dispatch team. We built a mobile, or sorry, a web app for them. They were doing this all in spreadsheets uh, that basically said, uh, you know, p- put the loads out. So we call them loads of sand. We put it out there for drivers and say, hey, I have loads that need to, li- to be delivered from point A to point B. Um, here's what I have available. And the drivers, we developed a mobile app. They would see, oh, there's a load available. It's in my area. I'll pick that one up. So through their app, they would basically accept the load. And then um, they would go to, you know, wherever the box was that they needed. If they didn't have a box already on their truck, they would go to the store's location for the boxes. They'd go to the sand mine, um, to what we call the loading facility. And when they got there, they didn't have to get out of their truck, which was a big deal in that industry because safety is huge. Um, and they could stay in their vehicle and go to a touchscreen kiosk and enter a PO number. It would then talk to the ERP, pull back the order information, uh, and then they would confirm and enter information about, you know, trucks can have multiple hatches. So they would say, I have two hatches or I have three hatches. Um, the system would calculate how much sand was needed. And it would integrate with the scale. So the truck, or truck driver would you know, drive over the scale. It would weigh them in. Um, and it knew how much sand needed to go in each place. When they were finished loading, they would check out again with the kiosk. And it would automatically send that back to the uh, ERP system. They would leave the facility, drive to the well site where the customer's waiting for the sand. Um, the, the app would use location tracking and geofencing to confirm arrival, update the status. They'd unload their box, they might pick up some empties, and then they're on their way. And meanwhile, the system, they close out the load in the app, 
it tells the HR system this load is completed. They were paid by the load, so it authorized payment for the driver. It would also authorize billing for the customer. So this was this fully kind of integrated solution, and the customer had a portal. So at any time through that process, the customer could check the status of the, the load so that the systems are all communicating throughout the process. Uh, so just a great story about integration, which I know is uh, near and dear to you. Um, and just, you yeah, know, we've just given your, your background and history. Um, but, you know, the integration of systems, having the right information um, where you need it, you know, where and when you need it. And uh, it just was really a, a game changer for that business. Allowed the business to grow 4x in volumes and revenues, um, saved you know, over a million dollars a year, improved the speed of invoicing. So they were able to reduce invoicing um, turnaround times by about 30%. And then the company grew to take uh, a good chunk of market share, grew from 10 to 25% of market share. So real good success story. And they've continued to evolve. They've now added some smart routing and smart dispatch and some other things with the newer technologies. But uh, just uh, that was a, a fun project, a lot of fun to do. And also just very, very rewarding because you could see the um, the impact and, and the partnership of the business was really key in, in that success. Now, this is a fantastic one. So, so the, I really think about this kind of end-to-end -end process. You know, it's almost like the order to supply chain to cash kind of process. It's a, the lifeblood of the company and, and, you know, what helped the company, as you said, uh, a scale to, to a new, new level. Uh, that's uh, actually, let me ask you, because you, you mentioned it, uh, this uh, partnership with the business. Uh, that's one of the things that, that I'm just really curious about. You know, I used to be in, uh, I used to do BPR, business process re uh, design back in the days. I think you, you had some, uh, some time of that as well. So I was on the business side and I was always, um, you know, my experience back then was actually, um, you know, not so great. How, how that interaction with IT worked. Tell us a little bit like what you guys did there at US, US Silica and how did that work out? Maybe, maybe there's some advice for, for, for some of your peers here on, on, in the audience. Yeah. And it's funny because I was listening to some of your other podcasts and I heard you mention the, the BPR. So I'm of the same era. Uh, I also uh, grew up in the BPR you know, days. And um yeah, yeah, of course, on the on the technology side more than the business side, but I I do think you know, it, and things have evolved. So you know, we, we call it something else, but a lot of the concepts are the same in in my mind. Uh, but I think that that partnership and really understanding to me, I, I've always been a process person at heart. I started my career in process improvement, and then I just naturally landed in technology. But the core of my you know process mindset. Has, has just always sort of been part of my journey. And I think part of that is putting yourself in the business, in your customer's shoes, whether it's the business. In my case, I've worked a lot with internal business units, uh, some with external customers, but just putting yourself in the shoes of whoever it is you're trying to serve and, um, and, and bringing them to the table. So the changes are being done to them, it's being done with them. And um, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, you know, I always tell people we're making sausage. It's really ugly during the process, but at the end, you have something that's solid and, uh, and you know, that, that you've produced something. So sometimes it's a little messy. You know, we, we kind of iterate, we brainstorm together, we might map things out, we might find things that work and things that don't. We try things and see what sticks. But I think that partnership, the collaboration, um, you know, making sure the business or the customers at the table and having those conversations and we don't make assumptions. And, you know, I've been, as you mentioned, in different industries and these industries have all had what I would call the field. It might've been the lab. It might've been the, you know, getting out on the trains and being out in the, in the yards and on the railroad or in, you know, Silica was actually putting on a hard, hard hat and going out into the mines or going to our transload facilities where we interacted with, um, with our, uh, the, the folks who picked up our sand and, and took it to their destination. So wherever it is, getting out there in the field and getting out where the business is and really understanding the business and how it works um, and not just sitting in the ivory tower of headquarters and making assumptions. I think that's that's really key is understanding um, the business, having the right people at the table, collaborating together, co-creating um, and using some tools along the way to help. But but really, it's the, the representation. That I call it the two in a box concept. Uh, where it's business and IT working together. 
And then how do you how do you look at what you're adding as the IT organization? Of course, I mean you're adding the knowledge of the technology of the solution to make it all happen, right? That's that's a given. I, I would agree, but. Um, it seems to me, especially given you've done this now, I mean, you're almost like seamlessly moving between like very different industries. We haven't even gotten to the mm-hmm. uh, the, the biotech world mm-hmm. yet. Uh, you know what? So, so I'm always thinking like, you know, I, I, I think I saw you studied math and finance, I believe, if I, if I get this I right. Um, because we had a discussion yeah. with, uh, with some friends the other day, it's, uh, so my experience doing the BPR thing back then was that a lot of people actually, for them, it was very hard to, to see that these systems or the solutions, they might be able to describe it, but then to really take it to that solution level, to visualize processes and so on, it seems like it's not everybody's business uh, or, or like, you know, that they're... And, and, and I was wondering what it is, obviously in, in, you know, I study electrical engineering system thinking is kind of like native to it. Uh, I mean, how do you look at it from, from your role? Is this what, what IT really adds? I mean, in addition to that curiosity to want to uh, partner with the business, then kind of bring that uh, rigor of the solution design. And how, how, how do you think about that? Mm-hmm. I think it's a very fair question because a lot of times, you know, we'll never know the business as well as our business partners, right? So, you know, and and I don't think we necessarily should pretend to, but I think we should understand it well enough to have an informed conversation. Uh, But I think what we bring to the table, in addition to just the technology and being able to potentially look at various solutions, is um, the, the curiosity, like you said. I do a lot of asking why. Um, you know, so why do we do it that way? And the five whys continue to keep digging into um, the, the different you know reasons why we do things. And um, I, I think also it's exposure to how things have been done elsewhere. So I came from you know biotech to actually started in defense, then consulting, then biotech, um, uh, then mining and minerals, and now rail and transportation. And I've seen some things that are common across those industries. So while they're very different industries, the uh, te- technologies and even the processes have a lot of similarities. So I can start to see you know, that math mindset has helped me just in terms of pattern recognition. So looking at you know something that works in one place, why wouldn't that work somewhere else? So you know, I, 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 I think for me personally, it's around um, the, the you know, questioning curiosity, benchmarking, understanding how things are done elsewhere and being able to think outside the box. And because I'm not so close to it, I'm not doing those things every day. I might have a different perspective than someone who is, you know, it's hard to think uh, differently if all you know is what you've seen. So sometimes that's helpful just to be able to kind of push people to think a little bit differently um, and to appreciate other perspectives. And sometimes if you bring in, you know, different stakeholders from different groups, um, you know, that, that that helps as well. We have a, we just formed uh, fairly recently formed innovation team here at Amtrak, and uh, you know I noticed that a lot of those folks the same thing that just seen a lot of different ways things have been done. So there's a certain way they think, and just a certain line of questioning, a certain way they can trigger others to kind of think that way. And um, so I do think it's somewhat of a unique skill set. Not everybody can do that, um, but I think if you get enough of those, you know, used used to be that. Um, BAs, you know, today in the agile world, we have a lot of different titles for folks with just kind of those core business analysis skills. But people who can bridge the business to the technology and can just help think about how, um, you know, how we can do things differently and how what's worked in one place might be applicable in another. So I I don't know that there's a, you know, specific golden nugget, but I think it's just in fact, it goes back to, I guess, process mindset, because it's just being able to think in a way that uh, connects the dots. I always talk about the, the people who are most valuable to me in the organization are the dot connectors. You can see things in different places and say, hey, if that works over here, maybe we can leverage it over there. And it kind of goes back to that example I gave about the, the data that we're collecting from the trains and the trucks. So we're doing that for a specific purpose to improve our maintenance processes, but that data is also valuable in other places in the business. So how can I connect dots and see where else might this information be valuable and what other information might be valuable to this process? 
Uh, so again, dot, you know, dot connecting, I think, is a, a kind of key skill in this, in this area. Yeah, it seems like, you, you know, one of the things when I worked in consulting uh, that, that, that surprised me was what a good facilitator can actually add to an exercise like this. We had one person who actually, interestingly enough, wasn't even that close to the business, but I think he just had that skill to, as you said, connect the dots between different people and facilitate a discussion. And it was just really, really powerful. The The other thing it makes me think of is, you know, I did the BPR and then I landed here in Silicon Valley. And uh, before, you know, founding Workado, uh, co-founding Workado, um, I had product management roles. So it, it, and yeah. a lot of what you're talking about seems very, very similar to a product manager, a good product manager in a software company. Yeah. So it seems like there's a little bit, um, you know, the modern IT leader probably has to have a bit of a product manager type mindset. Would that be fair? I, yeah, I agree. And that's why I was saying so that the business analyst role sort of evolved now. Um, and I think some folks who, you know, excelled in that um, space can make really good product managers. Because again, it's it's all around connecting those thoughts and understanding, um, you know, understanding how the business connects, how the technology strategy connects to the business strategy, how um, different you know elements of the business work together, and what a vision might be for where that how that can evolve. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I agree with you on that. So, so, so tell me a little bit. You said like you uh, benefited in your. Um, in your career from kind of like doing it in different industries and applying techniques in a way across different industries. Is there, is there any, are there any patterns or any kind of commonalities that you've, uh, that you've seen maybe, maybe kind of as some, some quick wins for people here on the, on the listening to the podcast somewhere where you've seen like, Oh, I, I think these are typical processes we, you can always improve on or, you know, certain typical gaps. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, anything that involves um, spreadsheets <laughs> and, uh, and manual processes, a lot of times what we find is that people are doing things, um, you know, outside of a system because they haven't found a system to do it. But mm -hmm. the, yeah. there, there are oftentimes there are opportunities. Um, and, and, you know, I think just follow the business. So if you can trace end to end, um, you know, whether it's, you uh, you know, manufacturing process or distribution process or a service that's being provided, um, just kind of breaking that down into the, the different components that make it up and look for um, where is the bulk of the work, you know, that the manual labor being consumed, there's probably a way we can um, automate that. I would also look at it from a data perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, what kind of data is being generated, who can benefit from that data? How can we share it? How can we make sure that data we're collecting in one part of the business that might be applicable in other areas is um, is leveraged in a way we have the technology platforms where we can share that out to to other parts of the business that might have a need for it. Um, yeah, I, I think that just in my experience, some of the business types that I've worked with do tend to have kind of um, you know manual work. You know, we can't take away, you know, loading a, uh, uh, well, I take that back. I was going to say we can't take away loading a truck, but you, you can't, you kind of can because, you know, we used uh, technology to integrate with the loading systems. Um, but, you know, anytime we're, we're trying to pull uh, data, uh, whether it's, um, as I mentioned in the sandbox example, um, you know, we, we didn't produce any paper along that way. And previously it was very paper-based, very spreadsheet-based. In fact, they used to send boxes of all the sand tickets. The truck driver used to actually handwrite tickets. Um, they would send all the evidence uh, that they had to produce to send to the customer to say, you know, here's all the proof that we did <laughs> what we said we would do. So, you know, all that goes away with technology because you can, you can communicate through um, systems that can share that data from the equipment that's loading the sand to the truck driver and needs it to the customer as evidence that we've, you know, delivered a load. So I think, um, you know, I think just kind of following the process and looking at for, for choke points, looking for things that are consuming a lot of time and looking for where data can be shared with others who could benefit um, is kind of a good starting point that I've seen work across a lot of different industries. Mm. 
It's very interesting. So it seems like you mentioned, like, I think you started out in the military, right? Uh, de defense briefly. Well, I was, I was on the, on the, um, I was on the uh, civilian side of defense. Civilian side. But, but I, if I, if I, I hope I get this right, but I think you were on the logistics side, right? Defense logistics. Is that correct? Defense log yeah. So yeah. I see defense it, logistics, it, it, yeah. it seems to me like what you did at US Silica. I mean, that to me seems mm -hmm. a little bit like a logistics operation. You probably uh, you probably brought a lot of good uh, insights from your earlier work in in uh, defense logistics to I, I, I speculate right to that exercise. Whereas <laughs> on the on the uh, Amtrak side, I mean, it does seem like very data oriented. So it almost reminds me a little bit maybe the biotech, the lab work, and the automation, and and there are, maybe there's some similarity around data. Is that? Am I am I thinking wrong the the, the the right lines or I'm just curious? Oh well, I'd say there's definitely some of that, but there were more similarities between the mining industry and uh, and the transportation industry that I didn't expect. For example, our control systems that we use to distribute power along the Northeast Corridor for electric trains, um, we we leveraged some similar technology out in the, the mines um, for uh, you know basically. Um, controlling equipment. So if you think about, about that. So there were some synergies between those two industries. Uh, but uh, that the biotech industry was also data heavy and also was you know, the big project there was moving from paper notebooks, literally writing down, you know, it's think about your doctor's office, you know, 20 years ago, everything's written on paper, right? Uh, kind of a similar process, but moving to an electronic lab notebook that was all captured, you know, digitally. Really uh, that cool. was the, the big project there. Cool. So, so when you do this, what what I'm curious is um, kind of both the challenges, right? That kind of makes these things hard. And I so I, I speculate mm -hmm. things like you know getting to the data and so on. It makes makes things hard. Uh, maybe thinking beyond just what the the manual process looks like, and even being able to envision what it could be. But then also what I'm Maybe the other part of the question would be like, what's the opportunity? And I'm, and I'm specifically thinking about AI or generative AI also. Uh, mm -hmm. How is uh, how's that maybe changing or opening up entirely new uh, potential for these kind of process improvements? Yeah. So I, you know, I I think for, you know for us, the example I gave with the um, uh, the, the predictive and uh, and condition-based maintenance is, is probably more traditional AI. Um, but I think that um, I, I mentioned that I spoke to a former colleague who uh, from the U.S. Silicon days who was continuing to evolve the sandbox system. And, you know, what we did back then was pretty cutting edge. But since then, they've added um, some algorithms to automatically dispatch loads to certain drivers based on their location and based on where the boxes are and where they need to deliver those to. So, um, you know, so I think, again, you can continue to add more intelligence as you learn. And, uh, you know, I guess one of the big things that I've learned is start small and then continue to iterate. So um, same thing that we're doing here is, you know, start with um, a, a business problem you're trying to solve, maybe do a prototype or an MVP, and then get some success behind you and then continue to iterate. Because I think we try to, to boil the ocean uh, oftentimes, these projects go on for years and you don't get the benefits. So with with AI, I think that also gives us the opportunity to um, spin up prototypes, you know, potentially fairly quickly. The market has definitely grown quite a bit, especially with uh, generative AI just over the last you know, 12 months. So uh, I think if we give it another year, you know, year or two, we'll see even more products that allow us to... Um, you know, to develop a more proofs of concept of prototypes that uh, can help us get solutions in place faster. So um, I don't know if, if any of us could have imagined a few years ago what we're starting to see happen so quickly. Um, but I think that uh, it does definitely provide us an opportunity. And uh, I think also, you know, our business customers are getting very savvy. So they're seeing it because we're faced with it every day. You know, you, um, you see AI in the uh, Link, you know, LinkedIn almost wants to kind of ask you if you want um, 
AI to help you, uh, you know, rewrite your LinkedIn post. But we're seeing it, you know, just everywhere. So I think pretty soon it's just going to be, you know, much more mainstream. So if we're not on top of that, um, our business customers are going to become, you know, more savvy than we are. So I think we, we're going to stay one step ahead. And I think it does open up a, a lot of opportunity for us. No, that's great. So, I mean, obviously, I think by now the audience, I think, has uh, has noticed, like, you know, how you have that system thinking mindset, that uh, product manager mindset, you know, you're curious about the business, you're, you're going for kind of the really interesting projects that really moving the business forward. I mean, there's not, obviously, there's nothing wrong with putting like an HR system in or moving all the applications to a cloud data center. That That's all great. But I think... I think the, the 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 projects you described there, I think they're just having such a bigger impact on on the business now. Now, my question is obviously, you're not alone, right? You're the leader now at Amtrak. You you have hundreds of uh, of uh, uh, people in your organization. How does that look like? How do you how do you bring these people along with this new mindset? Because I I, I speculate again. You I'm, I I might be off here, but I. I I imagine there's other, some people in IT who don't think exactly the way you think, or kind of more, much more traditional, mm -hmm. uh, uh, technology oriented. You know, keeping the lights on, a kind of uh, a mindset. How do you how do you bring your organization along? Yeah, I, you know, it's a good question. I think that uh, exposure and just encourage. I encourage my team to get out on the rail and Amtrak as a whole does that, you know, our CEO and our executive team, they're always out on the railroad, um, you know, talking to our customers, talking to our employees. And I think we need to do the same in IT because that's the best way to learn is to, to get out and talk to people, uh, understand the challenges they're dealing with every day and how can technology potentially help. Um, so that, that's a big part of it is just making, um, making those opportunities but you know creating that the space for people to have the time to go do that um and then we're bringing some um i guess product mindset product uh sorry product management uh practices into our organization uh, moving to more of a skilled agile frameworks fairly um new for us but that's a, that's something that we're evolving we've hired uh, several product managers to kind of help bring that thought along, offering training to folks. Um, so I think giving people the tools and then uh, giving them the time to go develop the, the skills to do that. And I mentioned two in a box earlier for, you know, all of our key large business technology projects, we do try and partner with the business. So we try and have co-leads, um, you know, co-sponsors, co-leads from both the business and IT and even our organizational change management uh, practices. So we do have our own digital technology OCM group, but we partner with a business OCM so that they take ownership of the change. So I think, again, that, that partnership is key uh, and just making sure that we're bringing our business folks to the table and we're learning from them. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Anything uh, organizationally? I mean, are you trying, it seems like you're really trying to fuse the business and the IT side a little bit. I mean, co-leads, I guess, are you putting them, you know, I, 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 I um, I visited one of our customers and, and it was actually a company in the education space, higher ed, but they had, uh, they had embarked in a similar kind of uh, agile team uh, um, uh, concept. And they were actually all sitting like a couple of business people and then uh, IT people with testers and, and more product management type folks. They were all sitting around in one room, in one circle. It was, it was actually pretty cool. Are you doing some, some, some of that? We are actually last week, we did um, what we call our PI sessions so every 12 weeks, we bring people together to do planning. We haven't implemented this across the entire organization yet, but we um, we are implementing it in a phased approach. So yeah, last week we had business people side by side with IT people um, doing planning about you know what are the priorities, what are the key things we need to focus on, what's going to bring the most business value to make sure we're working on the right things. So that... Um, we are doing that and it's it's been good to see what can happen when you bring some great minds together perfect perfect no this was fascinating i, I i'm curious so so obviously we have uh plenty of people here listening in i mean if you would give uh 
the Audience some advice, or I don't know if there's any other learnings that we haven't talked about yet. Any any wisdom? If if, if someone says like, okay, I I really want to do what uh, what Judith uh, also is 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 doing here. Like, how can they get started? You know, what would what would you advise? You know, I think first is is, is an open mind and, and being um, you know willing to be a sponge and just to learn. I think no matter what role you're in, whether you're in you know, a role like mine or um, someone just starting their career, understanding the business, getting that uh, business acumen and being able to speak to business people like a business person and not like an IT person. Because, you know, you kind of see the eyes glaze over when we start to talk IT speak. Um, so I think if we can speak in, in the language business understands, um, I think that makes a big difference. So that's what I would encourage is, you know, always be interested and willing to learn uh, be willing to get out of out of your seat and go, you know, travel the network, whatever that happens to be for the business you're in, um, and observe and and you know listen and take it all in and then kind of process and, and be a, see if you can build a the the relationships are key, you know, build the relationships so that you get trusted business partners that will want to kind of co collaborate um, with you. Uh, I think that's that's important, and um, I think the other thing is a leader. I would say is that, that really helps with building those relationships and celebrating success. So when we do have some wins and try and find some quick ones, you know, try, try to do those MVPs. But when we have wins, make sure we're celebrating those and acknowledging all the people on both the business and the technology side that we're a part of that because that builds trust and relationships. And then next time there's something um, that, that you can collaborate on that the business will remember to invite you to the table. You know, we need to make sure that um, those relationships can help us get a seat at the table with the business and can help us get the buy-in that we need to actually implement change. So uh, I, th I think looking at the business as more of a partner than a customer. And it's kind of like you were saying, the traditional IT, we used to be order takers. We used to just do, uh, you know, do whatever we were asked to do, keep the lights on, take orders. I think uh, we can add a lot more value if we can be partners and if we can understand the business so we can then make sure we're working on the things that are going to need all the most um, for the business. I think those are probably my, my big takeaways. I guess the other thing I probably haven't said yet, and it's tempting in uh, process improvement to just automate what we already do manually. Um, so we just take a, a bad process and add technology and then we have an automated bad process. So I think asking the whys and really um, thinking about the art of the possible and you know, not 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 so much just taking what we do today. I think it's important to know, you know to know the as is just because you need to know where you're starting from. Um, but don't let that guide the to be. Really try and uh, get get people thinking outside the box. No, hundred percent. I think actually in the book we we talk about this is kind of I I believe what marries that process mindset with the growth mindset. Just being open to mm -hmm. it might not just be the just automated process as is, as you said, it, 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 the, the new, the better process, the improved process might actually look completely different. Uh, it might be, right. and that might be facilitated by data that's available or, or data that yeah. you're, you're getting now in, in, in new ways, or it might be facilitated by new applications that you're adding and that do certain things. Yeah. All of that is, uh, is really key. I mean, listen, this, mm -hmm. this was fascinating. I'm so glad we had you uh, on the podcast. I want to thank you again for taking the time. I know you're running a big organization. Uh, you're kind of helping us uh, all get from uh, places to places here. So thank you. Thank you for all uh, for all your time. And uh, yeah, I uh, wish you all the luck with this new uh, predictive maintenance uh, project and solution at Amtrak. That's exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you like what you heard, we do have a special offer for you. If you share this or any other episode of the podcast on LinkedIn with the hashtag TNAM for the new automation mindset, that's T-N-A-M, our team will reach out to you and make sure you get a free hardcover copy of the book by our Workado CEO, Vigitella. Please make sure to rate today's episode, leave us a comment with your thoughts and subscribe to the show so you will never miss an episode. I'll see you next time.